Now for more with Chris Wallace. He's anchor of Fox News Sunday, and it's great to have you here. To get some perspective on how this plays out in Washington, um, Alex Acosta has had to answer questions about this before, but arguably this will be the most high-profile and uh, most consequential for his career. Absolutely. Uh, I think that there are several factors at play at this point. First of all, as Kristen pointed out, this news conference, uh, I, word apparently came from the White House to the secretary. You got to go out there and you got to defend yourself. And you can be sure that this will be playing to an audience of one, that the president is going to be watching this either live or on tape and coming to his own decision how effectively Acosta has dealt with all the questions about the plea deal, and especially the part of it that was later ruled illegal, the decision that was made and that Acosta approved not to tell his accusers in Florida about the plea deal that was going to get him a pretty lenient sentence mm -hmm. uh, in state court and no federal mm -hmm. charges. So first of all, how this press conference goes. Two, are there going to be new facts that come out? Uh, obviously, uh, we know that there are new facts that have come out in terms of the new indictment in New York City. But will new facts come out about the plea deal that was made in Florida? And then third, and you could see the power of that new accuser coming out and uh, appearing on television. If you start to see a flood of these women, particularly women who were down in Florida, who were underage, who were never told uh, that uh, this deal had been made between then U.S. Attorney Acosta uh, and Epstein's lawyers, uh, that could be very damaging as well. But job one for Alex Acosta, if he wants to keep his job, is to do well in this news conference in half an hour. As we saw the vice president's chief of staff saying that um, it was a case that the defense attorneys for Epstein wanted Alex Acosta to get off the case because they thought that he was too tough. Uh, you know, back when he was at the Justice Department, um, before he was U.S. attorney, he started a task force, an anti-human tra sex trafficking task force. And U.S. attorneys, typically, they want to be tough prosecutors. And this, I guess maybe we'll see him maybe decide to finally open up and explain why it was that he took this kind of unusual action to do this for Jeffrey Epstein, who, as we look at it now, absolutely didn't deserve it. Well, exactly, because what one is concerned about, obviously, is between this plea deal in 2008 and the 13 months that Epstein spent in, in prison, actually in Palm mm -hmm. Beach County, and was allowed out for, I think, 12, 13 hours a day, six days a week to go to his job. So in this prison sentence, half the time he wasn't actually in prison. And then he gets out and comes back to New York, and then allegedly more crimes are committed. Mm -hmm. uh, that obviously is, is going to weigh very heavily. And I, it's interesting that Acosta is not just going to make a statement, but as you heard Kristen Fisher say, he's going to answer questions. I suspect there are some of those reporters in the Department of Labor uh, press conference room are going to be loaded with real ammunition. And there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of tough questions to ask Acosta. And as I say, the, the country is going to be watching, but especially somebody at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is going to be watching to see if he's persuaded that Acosta has dealt with this. Yeah, because uh, the questions are not going to stop. We have this tweet here from Maggie Haberman. Um, she writes that Acosta was pushed into doing press conference by President, uh, the president. Uh, the president is following the news coverage closely. Acosta wants to defend himself now, but also has few fans in Mulvaney-run White House. Um, so, also, I, I read just a moment ago that the White House is saying he wasn't, Acosta wasn't told he had to do this. He was encouraged to go out and defend himself. But this dis does come just a few days after there were background quotes from people in the administration saying they think maybe uh, Alex Acosta hasn't done enough at the de Labor Department as quickly as possible as they would like because... You know, they want to be more aggressive. And that, to me, was a little bit of a tell. There, there might be a problem for Alex Acosta staying as Secretary of Labor. Yeah, and specifically on the issue of deregulation, that there are a lot of regulations of, uh, in the workforce, and they felt that as the Secretary of Labor, he could have pushed more aggressively on that. And uh, at one point, the domestic policy chief basically came in and fired Acosta, chief of staff, as a not very subtle warning to the Secretary of Labor, you've got to get going here. We mean business. We want to see more rolling back of regulations in the workplace. So he doesn't have a lot of friends. He doesn't have strong standing. But again, as I said, he's, he's playing to an audience of one. And this is not totally unlike, obviously, different circumstances, but not totally unlike when Brett Kavanaugh appeared in that hearing after Christine Blasey Ford. Uh, and I know uh, from very good sources the president was, was shaken 
by the power of Christine Blasey Ford's testimony, and he wanted to see uh, his nominee for the Supreme Court, Brock Kavanaugh, fight back. Defend himself. And mm -hmm. he felt that Kavanaugh did a very effective job there mm -hmm. and obviously stood by him, and he's now on the Supreme Court. I, I suspect that to a certain degree this is a job re-audition for Alex Acosta for Donald Trump. Chris Wallace, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you.